everybody, this is Cinnamon Cooney, your art show friend. Today I'm going to show you how we can paint this gorgeous, very full and complete Autumn Still Life together. I'm going to break down every single technique, every brush stroke, every layer, so that if you would like to paint this with me at home following along, you absolutely can do that. To help you do that, I have included a bunch of extra resources, a traceable, a grid. Today I will be demonstrating how to uh, draw in the images. But if you're not ready for that, those resources are there for you and they are free. I want to welcome everybody coming in on Facebook or YouTube watching today for the live stream or welcoming you if you're here for the replay. This is a fun class and to help keep it fun is my husband, John. Hello. So what John does is he keeps our like equipment working and makes sure the camera's posed, like pointed at what I'm doing. He asks questions from you guys during the live show. If you have a question, put it all in caps. Either a moderator will find that answer for you, or maybe you get your question asked live on the show. Hey, babe. Yes. Speaking of technology, I have no screen. Who? Oh. <laughs> hey, turn your light on. Okay. I have no idea. <laughs> it's just one of those days. It's just one of those days. Oh, my gosh. It's not even plugged in. <laughs> Is this show live? I don't know. It might be. <laughs> I'm going. I don't know what screen I'm on, so I don't know if I can go to oh, materials. Oh, you're okay. Yeah. Am I on my yeah. material? Am I on my, I'm on my hands? Yeah. Okay. So John's going to talk me through that. I'm going to push this button to see if that helps. Nope, that did not help. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't help in any way, which is why I'm not stunt hands. <gasps> I see something. Just a, ah, there I am. Okay. So these are live shows. They're live teaching shows, but they're always left up for you guys to be able to paint with along at home. At the end, we like to timestamp them and bookmark them into chapters that match a written out mini book. Those mini books come out seven to 10 days or so after a show and they're free to download. You can print them out or you can just keep them on your device. Either is fi uh, fine. It just really helps you have a better result. That's what we're doing, right? We're relaxing with our fall landscape or our still life. We're chilling out and we're also trying to be successful in our painting. So it's about finding the balance of those two things. And sometimes those mini books are exactly the medicine that you need to get to the next place in art. Oh, I love it when I'm mini. Mini me. Today's uh, painting, while quite involved, is going to be on a nine by 12 surface. Um, I expect this to be a two and a half hoot to three hoot. What that means in difficulty is, is that it will be easiest for you if you are a confident beginner. This is still for beginners. I'm going to explain everything I'm doing in detail, but it's gonna be a longer lesson and there's gonna be more layers. And if you're really new to painting, it may be a little fatiguing. Believe mm. it or not, we get in painting shape. It's a very strange thing. But it is everything is broken down, and you can always do more than you think if things are explained to you. Art is mostly difficult because of the mystery around it. It's actually pretty practical when you remove that mystery. The colors I'm using today are Mars Black, Burnt Sienna, Thalo Green, Cad Yellow Medium, Cad Red Medium, Dioxazine Purple. I've got a little Thalo Blue or some pizzazz, because it will really pop in this very orange painting. And I've got some titanium white. I may be using a mister during the show to keep my paint from drying out because I'm not on my wet palette today. And I also have my gloss glazing liquid. This is a slow drying extender. If you're really new to painting and you haven't worked with acrylic before, if you're finding that your paint is drying out on you too fast, those two things will really help you because this slows down the drying time of your paint without breaking the paint. Because a lot of the other resources to slow down the drying time of your paint at a certain point breaks your paint. Hmm. I'm also going to be demonstrating for the chestnut that's all fuzzy a very cheap brush today. I demonstrate really good quality art materials almost all the time. But every once in a while I like to let you guys know that sometimes the inexpensive stuff works too. It may not last as long. It may not hold up as well. But it can be as effective as needed for a particular brush stroke and get you through into your ready to determine if you want to invest in more expensive art supplies. Hmm. I think we're ready for step one. Are you? Yes. I might even have a step one button. Let me see if I've got one. I do. Look at that. Step one is going to be one of those easy peasy steps because we're going to just paint the background to color. I love those. Today is an acrylic ground. An acrylic ground is a thin coat of color that we put over the whole canvas just to give us a base so the canvas isn't white. Hmm. You could do black, you could do brown, you could do anything you want. We're going to do a dark brown. I'm going to take a big brush. This is a number 26 ruby satin. Um, bright. This means it's a square brush for acrylic, and I'm going to just paint the whole thing just some black and brown. I just don't want the white surface. Um, there'll be a few areas I may put some white back. 
for the color, but for the most part, I want this to be a very rich and deep still life. So I'm going to begin with a rich and deep color. This is one of those areas where I think new painters sometimes run into trouble because they don't recognize when a picture might require a ground and when it wouldn't. And when I looked at this one and I realized I wanted to have the depth I did, that was an indicator that I would be using a solid ground instead of just um, an underpainting. So hmm. to be really honest, you could do it with an underpainting too. There's usually five or six ways into a painting. And we artists just get to choose what we feel like today. One of the fun things about painting online with me is it really cleans up your feed. Cleans up your feed. <laughs> Suddenly you'll be getting lots of ads from all the craft and hobby stores. Oh. <laughs> and a bunch of other that junk that you don't enjoy getting will start to go away. The more painting classes that you do, the more the algorithm understands you and begins sending you art material information, which is what we really want from our weird stalking ads anyways, right? If we're going to be stalked, <laughs> we might as well look at things we want to see. Pick your stalking. Mm-hmm. It's just a, a side effect of something that I've noticed over my years being online, teaching online. Yeah. Is that if you are in an art practice online, watching art videos, clicking art videos, looking at art posts, your whole ad side screen gets so much better. All those weird, creepy ads start to go away. And then it comes back with like, this is very artful clothing. Do you like it? And you think to yourself, yeah, I actually like that. I'll click that. Thank you very much. <laughs> of course, you always got to be careful with what you click these days. It's true. You know, there's that whole rash of websites now that pretends to have product that they just stole from artists. <laughs> I found that out the first time when I saw a, a, a ball joint art doll by somebody that I follow. It's a very complicated, beautiful art doll um, style. And she does work that I admire. And it's, you know, $10,000 minimum to get one of the dolls. And I saw it for 300 and I was like, that seems odd. So I went to go look at it. I thought maybe she licensed it out. Nope. Nope. Just stolen. It's, a, it's sort of frustrating as a collector to, to come across fake stuff. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, I know that, like, I collect a rare artist who doesn't have stuff in circulation. And so when I find stuff that's a knockoff, I'm like, man, that, you know, just, pff, I don't want it. Well, and it just wastes your time. It does. It's like, it's noise. It is noise. But it's still better than the creepy noise. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like that, too. I'm like, that's true. I know this is probably fake, but it's still better than that old creepy noise it used to send me. You know what I'm talking about. That had nothing to do with you. You're like, no, I don't need that. That is not a health problem that I have or that I need to correct. <laughs> you know what I mean. All right, I'm going to dry. <laughs> I'm going to dry my canvas real fast. So if you have also to uh, dry your surface, don't forget to not use heat because heat's not your friend, or at least it's not the friend of your paint. Paint doesn't like heat. It gets color shift. It can do things like making it soft and sticky, and you don't need that. You just, you don't need soft and sticky paint in your life. You want, you know, paint that is layerable. And so when you come in here to the next layer, you want it to be thoroughly dry and not sticky so that you can put the next subsequent layer and get a good effect. Now, as she did here, it isn't super necessary to get a fully even coat, just a good coating down. <sighs> All right, that's ready to do the next step. Are you a step-worthy thing? Yeah, because we're going to sketch on the next one. I'm going to show you how you would loosely block this in with paint or draw it in with paint. Um, and you're certainly welcome to follow along. I'll break it down and explain it to you. Um, and I would say if you've been wanting to take that first leap and you're wondering if this is a good piece to do that on, it actually kind of is because what we have here is very simple shapes. They're cylinders. Uh, they're circles. And they're tubes. So, And even the pine cones are kind of an egg shape. These things are not complicated in their structure, and um, if you kind of know where they go, you can put them in. Plus, nobody sent home, like, the reference photo. And reference photos are just supposed to be that. They're just supposed to be reference. You're not supposed to be, like, so beholden to the reference photo that you can't step out into your creativity. Tubes. Tubes. The Internet is a series of tubes. tubes. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to take a T-square ruler to measure my canvas in half. This is a 12 inch canvas, so I'm gonna go to the six inch mark. Um, you may live somewhere that you use centimeters because that's actually more sensible. 
Some and place. Uh, hopefully your ruler has both measurements so you can find that six and then go, oh, these crazy people. All right, at four and a half, I'm going to come here and make a mark because nine divided in half is four and a half. I really hope that's true. I've lived my whole life believing it was. This is a watercolor pencil, and it's not a, like a Prismacolor pencil, which is made with wax. It's not going to stay on the canvas. It removes with a little bit of water and paint, and as I paint, it will vanish. I didn't press down incredibly hard. I just need to know where things generally are so that when I go to sketch them in, um, I'm not guessing as much. I am going to take a number eight cat's tongue. This is an art Sherpa cat's tongue. You can get these at Michael's or the brush guys, but guess what? What? You don't have to use this brush in this technique right here. I'm going to use it and that's, it's comfortable for me. You use what you have at home. It's not going to hurt anything. Huh. All right. Yeah. Feel okay about that. I'm going to grab a little bit of my yellow and brown and kind of mix them together. It's going to make a, almost an ochre, right? Yellow <laughs> ochre that we're doing. And I'll use this to sort of loosely sketch in general stuff because it's a good color for the different objects that we have. And, you know, it will blend in well with everything else. Now, you know. down here at the corner, I have two little bits of corn that are coming in an angle. I'm going to kind of make a little angled line here from about three fingers out and towards the center of the canvas. That's my stopping point for my corn. And I'm going to kind of guesstimate about an inch and a half from the halfway point. I'm going to bring a little line down. And as it comes near my, my stopping line, I'm going to taper it in. Now, its little friend is kind of covering it somewhat, so I'm going to bring it at a little deeper angle, almost all the way to that before I taper it in. And then we're going to come here and speak to that. So we've got the two little bits of corn kind of laid in. I did. Oh. I'm going to just draw that in. So just generally two little pieces of corn. Uh, right here in this sort of center area, we'll say about halfway up between the center of the canvas and the top of the canvas, and then halfway over from the center point of the canvas, we have a pumpkin starting to come in. I'm going to start just sort of sketching that in. I like to make little curved strokes as I go around. I build on them, you know, like little scales. This one's going to be shorter. Coming here. Now it's about, mm, let's put it actually about here, in the end here. So sometimes I'll bring that line around so I can see a little bit better on how it arcs and then build my little curves in. Going to come down around here. And we know there's that weird water chestnut, so I'm not going to have to worry about that too much. And curve up. And I know I've got some stuff happening here, so I'll put those out. Stuff. But they're the little ribs of my pumpkin. The great thing about squash is they're all kinds of crazy shapes, so you hardly ever have to worry about um, what it's doing. I'm going to add a little white to it so I can see my stem and I'll curve that sort of up. So that's a nice little stem curving up. A little curve line, it sort of tapers here and a curve line and a little white center. Now there's a little friend here that's coming down. And, and this one goes a little above my half inch point and comes down, oh, me intersecting the pumpkin right about here. Ah. And we're going to bring this down, and then we'll start to think about where the center of that stem is. Those bumps are very important. The bumps just help tell us a little story about the pumpkin, so that when we put those in, whether we're doing this interesting green, almost a ghost pumpkin, right, when we're doing that, we can um, really see the shape and, shape and structure of it, right? So that's nice there. I will probably keep... I was really vacillating guys on the water chestnut. Mm. You have no idea how much 
should we chestnut? Should we not chestnut? But I just thought, what an interesting thing to paint. And it's in the still life for a reason, and that's because it is an interesting creature. And that's what the cheap brush is going to do. Instead of using a grass comb or filbert grainer, I'm going to show you how a very cheap hog brush can do a very nice hair texture. Or in this case, a weird planty spine texture. Now up here, there's another little pumpkin. It comes up and it's kind of just, it fills up everything in the space, almost like with an inch around. So I'm going to add that right there. Its little stem is almost at the top. So I'll put its little stem almost at the top. And its little ribs are much less defined. It's more of a loose kind of, oh, I'm, I'm sort of a thing, but not totally a thing. And I think I might even paint back. And watch how I do this. So if you want to erase some of what you've done, you're going to take your white, uh, your black and brown, and you just come in and you go, no, I think you should be more like this. And you're not going to lose your background. See how I did? Yeah. So if I was like, oh, I don't like that, that's how I fixed that. Now, candles. Mm, I may switch over to a little uh, blue, purple, and white just for the moment. So because the candles are so different, I am loosely sketching them in and they will go away. But I need to make sure. Let's see. I'm going to come here about two inches out and ooh, about an mm, inch and a half from the top. Let me put it over here. And I'm going to make an ellipse. The ellipse goes off the surface. And over here, kind of coming to the right, ooh, about oh, a half inch, inch and a half from the top. I'm going to make a nice big secondary pillar here. Nice ellipse. Come down um, about an inch from the halfway mark and make another little, it's a little smaller than its friends, another little pillar. And then we can just... Do some little downward lines, right? Hmm. Candles. You now you may be adjusting these as you get into them, and that's okay. Your pillar candles. On your pillar candles, you may adjust them a bit, but don't worry about it. I am going to just keep on with my purple because I don't mind. And there's another ellipse. There's so many ellipses here, and the next ellipse is kind of this series of twigs. Mm -hmm. so I'm loosely sketching that in there. I will probably put in pine cones, but I'll worry about adding them later. I don't need to add them now. I also don't need to add in the loose uh, leaves now. This is just what I need to know where is. These are the major subjects of the painting. So I've got those in and laid out, and when I compositionally have my map, this is a compositional map, then I can come back and start to paint it in. If you weren't ready to freehand this in like this, go ahead and use the traceable, go ahead and use the grid. You can use the grid to help you do freehanding better too because it can help you see how objects relate to each other in the space that they're in. I always worry when students are really reluctant about the grid, and here's why, guys. It's not because you need to know an art thing or don't need to know an art thing is if you're trying to make that bridge from not drawing to drawing, being able to see how objects in a flat surface, 3D objects in a flat surface relate to each other, the way their lines converge, the way that they foreshorten, can be very hard to learn just off the cuff. And it can be another one of those tools that you don't just want to put on the ground. Um, and I just say that because I hear people say, well, I click away if I see a grid. If I even see a grid, I click away. Mm. And I'm just like, man, look at how good my students are in the group. And many of them started where you are today, and they got there because they did all the things. They jumped in and they tried everything with an open and brave heart. And maybe everything isn't their favorite, but they got a lot of skills in those art boxes now. Yep. Right. And we all start a beginner. So how we get away from that place, that beginning space, is just... You know what? Jump in. Be brave. If I'm demonstrating a grid, go for a grid. If I'm demonstrating traceable, go for a traceable. Go for all the things. Fred invites you to a figure drawing class. Don't worry if you can figure draw or not. Go. Just go. Right. Well, not anymore. Because <laughs> I keep closing everything down. But when you can go, go. When it's safe. Ah. All right. Let's call this a step. I'm going to sip my coffee.
and have right. John heat it back up because clearly what I need is more caffeine. Mm. More caffeine. This is going to be pretty. All right, well, let you grab that. So, yeah, it's, I think it's just important. Um, as artists, there are things that we have an affinity to, things that feel easier and uh, more relaxed subject matters um like we're like oh, I, I enjoy painting figures more than clouds or i enjoy you know grass more than cars and i get it you guys if you paint with me at all know that cars are not a subject for which i have a natural affinity but you guys even broke me of the bad habit of avoiding them because you're like hey i really want to do a car and you think you can figure it out and i was like you know what that's good for me i avoid this subject and i have become much better at doing cars because of you because you didn't let me sit on the sidelines and not participate. And I don't want to see you guys sit on the sidelines and not participate. Participation is totally fun. <sighs> so in this, we're going to kind of put in the distant background. I'm going to be very loose and abstract with the far off fall leaves. And the reason for that is, is while it's very sharp uh, in the photograph, or if we were painting hyperrealism, it might uh, compositionally be interesting. I think more I just want the loose kind of shape and structure and not as much to have the object super defined. I think for the composition, it's better for us. So I'm gonna grab a hat, it's a 3 eighths angle brush. You could grab a bright, you could grab a round, just a brush that you're comfortable painting loosely with. I'm gonna come here and get a little of my black and brown again. to around my pumpkin just a titch as you do doesn't hurt right give that second coat of paint never hurts to give that second coat of paint my friends never, never hurts, hurts. And come down here and you can paint a little over the objects that you uh, drew in you just need enough of a line to know where they are right you just need enough of a line to know where they are you know and you may be adjusting the line so don't be too precious precious is being really super careful you know, be brave, jump in, it's okay. Even if you're a perfectionist, perfectionists are brave. You guys are brave. It's very brave to look at a cupboard and think, I'm gonna alphabetize that. I think that's the most courageous thing I've ever seen. Because I look at a cupboard that's a hot mess and I'm like, oh, I'm just gonna do something else today. Mm -hmm. so, you guys are brave. Over here, I am doing a little more brown. Love it if we started seeing stuff that we expressed as failures. I see all the time people saying, well, I'm, I'm free spirited, but kind of like, like that's a fault or I'm a perfectionist, like it's a fault, you know, instead of it's a feature, mm. right? These are features. You were made this way for a reason. It's wonderful that you're organized or it's wonderful that you're free spirited. These things are both good. They're good things. I'm going to grab a little of my red and I'll get it into my black here. You can see it makes kind of a deep brown. If you ever did my how to make brown video, you're like, oh yeah, that's right. It does make brown. And I'm going to come here and just make, look, I'm pulling down and these are just loose marks. And because right here, this is a close value to what's in front of it, it does feel a little diffused and out of focus. I can get a little yellow into that and maybe a little more red, right? And come here and just speak to some things in the background. Yeah, it's there. It's there for sure. For sure, for sure. But we're not going to be too worried about it at this moment. Mm, it's a little more yellow than I would want there, to be super honest. And come here and get a little orange kind of worked out. I still want it to be dimmer. Little kind of implied maybe. There's something here, but we don't want to get too specific about it, do we? Mm. So this is something that we can do in our still lives when we're doing a background and we're trying to simplify a subject so it can become about certain objects and less about other objects. As a photographer, I might have different goals than I would have as a painter. I like the 
sort of muddled background. Isn't it fine? I'm gonna take a little. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get a little crazy here. I'm gonna take a little of my phthalo blue. Is that crazy? Phthalo blue is crazy. Can be. Can be crazy. I'm gonna come here and add just a kiss like that. This is this is something to be a little gentle with here. We're gonna be gentle with this. Put this in a few places. This isn't the only place I'm going to have blue, right? It's not the only place I'm going to have it. Um, I'll pull some up forward as well. Uh, it's just going to create, as, as you notice, just a little bit of drama in our diffuse background. Notice that the marks are small. Um, they're light. They have different angles that they lean to, and there's almost like a little blue halo around the pumpkins to give them definition in the space. Being an artist is fun. All right, let's call that a step, right? And then we'll come back and continue painting our objects forward. So I like to, in still lifes, um, and this, this is not the only way to do things, it's very important to get out of the mindset that there is a way to do things and a way not to do things or a brush to do something or not a brush to do something or a paint brand of paint. It's just a very dangerous set of thinking in art because there's always a different way. There's always a rule that breaks the rule, right? Like even my very strong do not set fire to paint or heat paint um, up with your torches. Don't do that. It's super dangerous to your health. Even my very strong statement there. There's an artist that's literal work, paints and pigment and fire. Now, they come in, they have respirators, they do a bunch of safety stuff. But of course, sometimes somebody's got to come break the rule just to make it a good rule for the rest of us. You know how that is? I do. You do? All right. I've got this kind of wonderful brown and yellow going, and I'm going to add a little green into it with my uh, angle brush here begin to paint in my stem a little more thoughtfully over here maybe a little more brown this time a little more green on top and then if i want to i might get a little white into that And very loosely define out that stem. It's a rough stem. It's a very loose stem. You know, there's always a way. A little green and brown here. Sort of shading it at the bottom. You can paint a smaller brush if this brush was uncomfortable or the brush size you're using is uncomfortable to you. Guess what? what? You can paint a smaller brush. I'm going to take my cad red and my dioxazine purple. And that's going to be the basis of this pumpkin, interestingly enough, which is a brave choice. But the reason for that is it's going to push it, as you can see, into the background. Oh, yeah. Come along here. It very expressively. Trying to get that color in. This is also a good time to check your shape, which I'm going to be adjusting. What I'm doing is just making sure I can see my image well. And I'm adjusting that shape. I'm going to put a slightly darker value down here. That's the purple and orange I'm working. Oh. Uh. Purple and cat red, sorry. I could work purple and orange. That would work too. That would work just fine. 
We'll get a little more red into it. Come right here. Add a little highlight of red. Strong little highlight of red. Isn't that nice? Let me get this. Uh... Trim it back with a bit of a shadow. Continue to come forward. With a little more red. Mm. The purple red shadow is, you know, between the pumpkins, pretty strong. Maybe get a little yellow in there, like I mentioned earlier. I like to find that shape mm -hmm. and add those little bits of glow and thought to it. I'm going to bring down little brighter lines. Certainly a lot more here. I'm just taking the toe of the brush. A little more yellow into that orange. Let's build some ribs up. Little downward strokes and pull back. Very loose, isn't it? It's having a little bit of a dry. I'm going to come over and get a little more yellow into my green mixture and maybe add a bit more white to it. Add that to the front. A little bit right there on the stem. There's a bit of a highlight. I'm going to knock that highlight back just a smidge. I want it to be bright, but not quite as bright as what I did there. Bright, but not quite as bright. Top eyelet, I do one as bright as I did. I'm thinking about my phthalo blue as the reflection on that pumpkin and feeling like it's too saturated. So Ooh. I do want the blue in there and I do want it to be the basis of the reflection, but I'm going to take a little bit of my purple and blue together. This is, I could go get um, ultramarine blue if I wanted. I'm wiping out. I'm not rinsing out. I'm wiping out. I'm creating a very light reflection that has this as its base. Need to get a little more water into my brush. I will. My brush right here. This is just a very light reflection. I'm going to add more white into it. Right here, that's a lot lighter, isn't it? Yeah. Now I feel like I've got to brighten my pumpkin towards the back. It's still too diminished into the back of the painting. So I'm going to grab more orange. Tilt there so you can see it. 
Yeah, sometimes you just do. You have to like pull it up so you can see it. You got to pull it up so you can see it. I need to pull this up so I can see it. I also need to trim and lighten that out a bit. Finding that right space. Finding that right value, that right temperature. Well, that's good. It picks up a little bit of orange. That really helps. Because you do want the reflection. You know, you do want it. You yeah. want it to have that little implied texture for sure. But you've got to get it in a way that uh, doesn't pull it too far forward. We can always come back at the end and where we need to, like, heighten something, we will. I'm on the corner of my brush. I'm just making sure that my pumpkin has... Oh gosh, some of this uh texture going. There we go. I like that quite a lot. Rinse out. It's getting to be a good time to change water. Um, so I'm gonna do that. Good, good time to change water. So I'm going to do that. And I'm going to say this is a step and let's move forward because we want to get a lot of this roughed in before we decide where we're going to go back and put our most focused attention in. Right? So it's good you get a generalized thing in. This is a nifty skill to learn. It may take you a minute. If you have not painted in that way, it can take you a minute to be like, what's the value? What's the, what's the heat? Is it warm? Is it cool? Is it, is it brighter? Is it, oh, did I drop on it? Oh, sorry. I do that a lot. I drop water on the painting. It's not good for the painting. So John keeps the towel off, off camera just for that moment. The, the, you know, painting in these sort of rough strokes and being loose like this can be very challenging, right, when we're trying to do things. So, you know, if you're finding it's taking you a minute to get to that space, don't be stressed about that. It, gets every, it takes everybody a little minute to get there. Doesn't mean you can't get there. You absolutely can get there. Ooh, I almost rinsed in my coffee. Which would be huh. Terrible. Now I'm going to say a quick thank you to all the star givers and super chat supporters and new emoji club members. Hi, Ka Kathleen. No, Catherine. Catherine, you remember? So hello to everybody. Thank you for your support. And I love seeing you guys here. Trying to get to where we are today. Where are we today? Cindy says, I wonder if you leave out one candle compositionally, so there are five main objects. So it's really interesting. Um, people worry sometimes if there's a numerical magic, and um, not really. You can. If, if the six and two corns are not working for you because they're even numbers, um, you know, uh, you could always take out a candle if it gave you mental rest. But compositionally, this is balanced fairly well. And it's the, it's the flow between the objects. And it's really more about the spaces around the objects than the objects themselves that would create your compositional balance. Um, when you're looking for compositional balance, you're not really looking for the rule of thirds. Understand a lot of the rule of thirds is based in almost an urban myth. Um, it, it is, it's a nice comp compositional place to make a jumping off decision. Like, where do I want to put my focus? How do I want my focus to be? Do I need to have a limited number of objects? Are there too many objects here for the painting to read well? Um, if you're trying to be more minimalistic and modern, you may want to start stripping objects out and, and remove objects. If you're trying to be more old world, you'd be looking more like how do the objects relate to each other and what are their meanings in relationship to each other in the canvas? Does this tell me something about life? You know, and, and still life is probably the most commercial of all of the painting methods, but it's not the simplest. Hmm. 
it still requires quite a lot of thought and you know you can lean on compositional guidelines and definitely no calm rules calm guidelines to say i'd like an uneven number of objects it's just an easy thing a teacher can say to a student who's really struggling on how to balance the thing out like try to make it an uneven number of objects because when you're arranging another an uneven number of objects it pushes you into a place where compositionally you'll be thinking about uh, creating balance distortion in the piece, right? Like where some areas have greater weight than other areas and you won't necessarily be trying to order things. If you're hearing that a lot from teachers, what they're really saying is you are being too symmetrical. Hmm. You need to create a little unbalance in the piece so that it feels balanced. And so that's what we're looking at. And, you know, if for you, you find that you've gotten that, if you have that right now, I actually like the way these objects relate to each other. Um, but again, you could do that at home. Uh, can I drop the link for resizing? Is there a mini book for this one? Seven to 10 days out. And thank you, Patty Hoffman. All right. All right. This, this pumpkin here, I think, shall we? Now for sure, this one is a bit more in the oranges, which I really, really like. Um, so I'm going to come here. I don't need it to be the cleanest orange I have. So it's okay if it gets a little of the other pumpkins color in, from here into it to keep it from being too much. But I'm gonna begin laying this in. Now, towards the bottom here, right, it's going to be darker than it is towards the top. And then there's also going to be these wonderful shadows in the very strong ribbing of this pumpkin. So I can start coming in and painting that out as I'm going. You could gray this with green, you could gray it with purple or black. Um, creating your dimmer values is really up to you. Sometimes you'll hear a, a teacher say you can't use black. You can, you have to be careful. That's again, what they mean is you're not being careful with your color mix and <laughs> I'm not really sure how to explain <laughs> it. So don't use black. I see that happen actually a lot where something's happening with a student that it feels difficult to explain and then you know you default to well if i give this guideline that will help them find that balance because maybe somebody helped you that way in art school said check an object out mm. take it out <laughs> you know what can you remove you'll have teachers come back what can you remove they'll love to ask you that what can you take out that's good it's a good question to be asked it's a good question to ask yourself so just again, very loosely at this stage, I just want to know where it is and what it's doing. I have a really great green um, stem. I'm going to put out a little more brown. I really like the way this stem goes this way and this stem goes that way. Very much enjoy that. Here at the base of the stem, there's this sort of depth and green that I very much enjoy. Mm. Trying to figure out which one I wanna, oh, I know what it is. Shoo, there you go. Sometimes my references, I have it set up where it's like, there's layers of things that I want to think about compositionally, but I forget what transparency I have that layer on. Mm. And then I'm like, wait, what? Why would I do that? And I'm like, oh no, it's a layer. Gonna grab a little yellow and get into here, as you do. And come across here with that yellow and kind of those little segments, right? Nice little segments that we're starting to talk about. A little more yellow, a little white. I am just using one brush. I'm still on this uh, three quarter inch angle. Why? Because it's got a nice sharp point. It's wide. It's just as fine. You can do a painting all with one brush sometimes. Mm. No, so don't feel like you can't because you can. I'm here and lightly put in those little elements. As you do, 
sometimes I will wipe my brush and I'll come back into the color I have it, just create a very much lighter version of it. Mm -hmm. Very rarely will you use like a, say a pure white. That is, that is the last art thing that you use in a piece. Hmm. And that's really nice. Looking pretty good. Now we've got these great shadows and we've got these great highlights. I'm going to come in and get my base orange again. My nice bright, bright base orange. And then I've got to decide how do I want to shade it? Do I want to use the purples? I kind of do like that. So I might get into this over here, right? You can see that that does something really lovely with the oranges. One, it makes a fantastic brown just on its own. If you ever need a brown and you forgot your brown paint. That orange and purple makes such a great brown. I'm going to come in and create a little triangle of shadow here. Goes wide here and triangles up. Hmm. Right, it's a little triangle of shadow. That's a lot about how the photographer lit the pumpkin. The photographer did a really good job with this. I find it, uh, I have several photo licensing websites because I don't steal photographers' photos. I don't think that's cool. <laughs> no. So I pay them as they should be for their work. And, um, but I found that, uh, like on paint my photo, there's like three photographers that do still lives I would use. And, uh, on any of the photo websites, just cause they photographed it and they lit it does not mean it would make a good painting. A lot of times compositionally, I don't know, they throw everything, but the kitchen sink at something. Mm -hmm. So it's really nice when you find a photographer that has their kit together as this one did. Um, in their lighting and how they're uh, putting a subject matter together and what they choose to put in. Like, honestly, this little spiky thing, that was just genius. I don't know how they came into that chestnut in its little shell. And I, and I looked at it and I ferreted at it. You know, I ferreted and ferreted at it because I was like, mm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm like, it's so interesting, but do I want to do it? And uh, eventually I was like, you know, that's just too compelling to leave. Yeah. You know, on the floor here, not doing it. Of course, I've got to do it. Get a little more orange kind of coming up here. You can see I'm just playing with those values, a little more red into my brown. Look at that go. Look at that go. See, it starts to very early on. If you're getting your values correct, if you're getting your temperatures correct, you're going to start to get a painting very, very early on. I probably do want to hit a slightly warmer uh, temperature there. I am going to hit it at the end because I think I need to see the balance of everything here. And just in case I swing way, one way or another outside of the ph photograph's parameters. Because that will happen sometimes too, as an artist. You'll, you'll go one way or another and you're like, oh, I don't hmm. know what I was doing here. Now, a, a warning. <laughs> I don't like to give warnings, but here I will. Do not put your love and attention right here in this zone. It's a good time to practice some value stuff. It's a good time to practice, you know, your shading and stuff. But don't put everything you've got right here because we're going to paint over it with hair. I love Bob. I was watching Bob the other night. But I got to say, every once in a while, Bob, and if you're a student of Bob, raise your hand takes you through painting an entire cabin and all the logs, which I promise I know you guys at home spent a day on and then put the tree over it. So I'm, I, the lesson I took away from that was tell your students when not to put a lot of heart into something. If you're going to stick a tree over the cabin, you got to let everybody at home know, do not put your soul into these logs. So don't put your soul into this zone because there's a lot of spiky bits that are going to happen. I wonder how many people have had that experience that will be weighing in now going, oh, that so happened to me. Mm -hmm. I'm bringing a little, it's a deeper value. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be working some deeper values and oranges here in the shadows and then the highlights up here. And hopefully what we get is this beautifully shaped gourd with this bright, strong, rah, color, right? 
What kind of water do you use for your paintbrushes? Water, water. Just water, water? Water, water. No specialist um, to it? No, I don't have any agents in it. I don't have, I agents stopped are using in your water. Uh, the, uh, oh gosh, it's had so many names. It used to be called Flowade by a Golden in my water because if you aerosolize that at all, it can do terrible things to you. And I, I looked, I talked with the company and, and they were like, this was such a professional product and it required so much of the students to read the safety data that I was like, oh, I'm not gonna demo that anymore. And that's kind of how I came to the Golden Glazing Liquid. It's super safe for you, it's super safe for your pets. And if you make a mistake with it, it doesn't ruin your painting or your life. So I don't put a lot of agents in my water. I don't paint with like airbrush medium or any of that. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing it. I just don't because it's not necessary. And I teach online. So sometimes I make decisions because I'm teaching online. Let's bring a little bit of that glow down here, just a touch. And it's important when you're teaching online, as I am, as other people are, to realize that, you know, everything we introduce, you guys kind of take on. I got to think about that stuff. I'm loving that. That's looking very strong. Whoa, don't put it in my coffee, which needs to heat up. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the coffee cup calls to you, isn't it? It does. It just says, come on, you can put a little bit in me, can't you? And your brush is like, no, what are you doing? I had to make a little bit of my shading because, like, again, it's very dry conditions and I don't have my wet palette out today. Why? Because once again, I was lazy and didn't set up. That mm. is the only thing about the wet palette is it does require some setup. And when I get a little behind in my studio stuff, sometimes I don't take care of it as I should. Just really refining and thinking about those shadows there. Have fun with it. Don't, mm -hmm. don't feel like you can't. Why? Because you can. You're pretty good at it. When you want the orange to be uh, more orangey, you get more into the red. When you want it to be brighter, you get more into the yellow. Hmm. So we're just trying to create, this pumpkin is a little more detailed than the one in the back, right? Both in its natural structure and the way it's, it's shaped, but also in that it's a little closer to us and it's a little more in our focus area. If you are wanting to get better at your composition, a good florist course. Hmm. I think uh, a good flower arranging course, like a good one, is a brilliant way to teach composition from oh, yeah. such a surprise place that your brain can't even get in your own way. And That's... you will start to organize your painting better. Just from those knowledges, those not that stuff carries over. You should see me do a cake. I could totally cake it. I could win any of those cake competitions. Yeah. If I had somebody with me that could really bake, like wouldn't mess up the baking part of it for any reason. Cause like for the decorate, I'd be like, yeah, two hours. Good. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> huh. Give me some fondant and some food coloring. We're going to go. It carries through. It carries through. It really does. These things, they relate. I'm getting a little more into the yellow here. I'm getting a little more into the yellow here. A little more into the yellow. Kind of comes here and really goes almost there. See how this is starting to happen? Mm-hmm. And again, a little more into the yellow here. 
Actually, sure, it's not yellow, though. It's still orange. I paint a lot of pumpkins. You guys have no idea. Like, every year. You do. You do a lot of pumpkins. I do a lot of pumpkins. I think before YouTube, my pumpkin experience was like almost none. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I ever painted a pumpkin like on purpose. If it was in something, it was there, you know, like as a other subject. I have to say being a teacher on YouTube has asked me to just deal with a lot of stuff that I might not normally think about. Look at that coming in so beautifully. So beautifully. And what do we like on this? We just, we're resisting the ultramarine when we don't have ultramarine to make a shadow. We can take our docks purple and our thalo blue. You want it to be light, you do. It's still... A bit. There we go. See how we got up into a lighter value? And again, I will come back. I'm on the corner of my brush. I'm just dry brushing up here. And just a light reflection. We'll get into the, the hot bar reflections later. This one's a little bit at an angle. Yeah, it's a little bit of an angle. Look at these go. We're just painting these like, yeah, we're going to power through this. It's not a problem. Mm-hmm. There it goes. Give yourself time. I've done still lives where we spent days with you guys painting tight. Tight, tight, tight. tight. Really the best way, I don't think. I'm going to go into my darker one here. Because it's cool now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. the the, it's a reflection, but it's a reflection that's a little bit in the... Come on now, right? And we haven't even put the pops. The pop, pop, pops. Yeah. We haven't even put the pop, pop, pops into the pop, pop, pop. We haven't. We could have, but we didn't. <laughs> Get a little of my white and blue again. There we go. That's creating a lot of energy in the still life. Huh. We're creating some drama. 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 On the canvas. All right. John's going to take a picture of this, uh, heat my coffee, and we will talk about... What are we talking about? Let's find out. Uh, okay. Oh, I already answered that. Uh, family family wants to know if I can paint a cocker spaniel on YouTube. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I imagine that in the Big Art Quest dog series, a cocker spaniel will be covered. Um, we've got pugs in the Maltese's coming up. We just finished that adorable Yorkie. If you're looking for dog paintings, we're doing a year of dogs. We'll be focusing on noses and fur and different kinds of aspects of dogs. So that's a really great way to go. Um, uh, Janet says, uh, thanks for the wonderful work assisting artists in so many ways. No, I love helping you guys. Look, at-home artists, artists that train themselves and figure out how they want to create on their own and teach themselves that are like my favorite. You guys are the bomb, right? You're not like letting anything, anything stop. You're like, I'm going to jump in. I don't, I don't know. I haven't done anything since like school and you jump in and it's like amazing. It is my favorite. So I'm here for you guys all the time. I'm here to answer questions. Um, um, I'm here to keep te te have you seen the calendar coming up through September have you gone and looked September 11th is going to be the next bird hop with my mother you should see this thing she and I are meeting like daily daily tactically planning for this like every painting coming up is like the bomb I did pull those two uh, if you go on Facebook you can see the reasons why I chose to pull the two that I did I just was not uh up for it emotionally right now hmm. um, sometimes that happens and you have to be very careful I'm gonna say something as an artist to you guys at home uh, to that issue um, 
art is good for your mental health. That is true. But mental health is sometimes its own journey. And one of the things that I have learned over the years is there are times that I can do a painting with maybe a more melancholy feel to it. And there are times that I cannot respect the times when you cannot. If you're just like, if you're going into a painting with dread, back out of it. If you're going into a commission with dread, don't take it. Never let dread become part of your art process. And, and it, is a, it is a feeling universal to artists. Like they will feel a strong sense of dread around something. Listen to yourself. Doesn't matter if I clean my brushes in cooler or hot water. Yeah, Lenore, it totally does. Believe it or not, uh, acrylic is super sensitive to temperature. So if you're using a good strip that break, a good soap that breaks down the acrylic, um, plug my own, the art strip of soap, because I made it for acrylic. But even if you're doing Dawn, right? Mm. Hot water will help weaken the any dried paint that's in the brush it helps weaken it and loosen it and pull it out you don't want to burn yourself um and some brushes because they're made badly will fall apart in hot water if you have brushes that fell apart in hot water be mad at the manufacturer not me <laughs> because they're not supposed to do that um but yeah good warm water does help clean out the brushes when you're doing the washing phase And Elena, what's a good tutorial to understand temperature in painting? Let me think on that and get with my team and see if we can't pull together a playlist where we really cover those things. Because I think I have through different lessons been like, this is temperature, but like off the top of my head, I, you guys know I have more than a thousand free art classes. Sometimes I'm like, I gotta go look. Like seriously, we sometimes, like if you change up a lesson, please put the tutorial link in. Don't expect us to remember, not even me, all 1,500 or whatever it is now, paintings that I have done. If you're going to change it, like, in any way, please, tutorial link for approvals. You have no idea how many there are. I'm going to get my watercolor pencil mm -hmm. out. And I'm going to just take a minute and kind of give myself a little clean up on my candles, on their ellipse. Right. Sometimes I like to do that. I don't know where my chalk is. I need to buy some more. I'm just sharpening. Again, this is a watercolor pencil, not a Prismacolor pencil. If you if you have a Prismacolor hand, pencil in your hand, I imagine that I just came by and took it out of your hand. <laughs> do the work for me, please, because you should not. Use. Actually, man, can I just tell you honestly, if you're going to buy colored pencils, could you get some Caron de Osh? I mean, you're not actually that much more money, and the experience between the two is insane. You have to heat Prismacolor to get them correct. There's all these things you have to do. We're sitting over in the corner of Crandosh who are doing it so beautifully right now, it will blow your mind. Even Derwent, uh, even anything by Faber-Castell, there's some good stuff. I don't have any feelings on that. I just got hated by the... <laughs> <laughs> the Prismacolor. I mean, I love the box of a million pencils. That part's super fun. I don't like um, the binder, and I don't like the way the pigment comes off of it. I mean, you know, definitely go by and check with Lockery because she's the pencil expert, but um, it's not my favorite. And if you're looking for a pencil expert, that's Lockery Fine Art. does a lot of product stuff all right so i get that in there mm -hmm. and i'm going to remind myself uh remind yourself what uh where my candle things go oh. oh i gotta put them back up for everybody else too yeah so we're gonna put a little stem in here <laughs> there you go i have this really cool idea for painting and i would tell you guys but i have somebody that, like anytime i post something now it shows up on their youtube channel and i'm like now i'm like afraid to post my stuff ahead mm. <laughs> like what is happening is it any ah! so i will have to show you later i can't tell you my cool idea for candle <laughs> but it is really cool and i think of it anytime i do one I'm just sort of drawing in my candle shape. And that's because I'm going to come in here and make sure I have a coat of white for this. Um, because the candles are so bright, I'm going to switch over to my number four round like you do. Like I, I'm supposed to do. There, there's one. I have them everywhere. All right. 
I've been experimenting with making my own sizing. Some of the experiments have gone badly, yo. <laughs> <laughs> like really, momentously badly. You make glue. <laughs> I have made some glue that was very challenging to get back out of the brushes. Mm. I'm going to come here and I'm going to just do this little part here. The reason is, is that the center of the candle needs to be almost white. And I am going to come and, you know, give myself some. Some glow and everything. But if I do this now, it will be just better for its whiteness. See, just making these little upward things. It's just yeah. a good idea at this time. It's very, very useful for us. Interestingly enough, I'm going to be working my yellow and purple together to make the candles. It's something kind of different than we've done. I could go into the red and purple, but I'm going to do yellow and purple in here. I'm going to take my purple and my yellow. And paint these in uh, with that. I may change my mind. I may get in and go, oh, this was a terrible plan, but I think it's a good plan. Sometimes you can get some really great neutrals with complementary colors. And by doing this, it will create a space in which the oranges are amazing. Mm. I'm going to carry my uh, candle down. And also because dioxazine is like nearly black. Have you guys noticed this about dioxazine purple? How nearly black it really is. Yeah. It is nearly black. You know what I noticed about dioxazine purple? Mm-hmm. Is um, it gets on everything. It's very staining. It's the most staining of the paints. You it's do sort not of like want it on your white dog or your white carpet. If you open a bottle of anti seas in the garage it's like that it just gets on everything you can't sure. get it off it just coats it it's like on you just a steady coat of copper on everything it is it is like the glitter of the paint world so you can see i add a little white where i want the candle to be lighter and then i'm going to add a little purple where i want it to be darker and i'm just getting the pillars roughed in this is pretty much the same as when we painted the pumpkins or we painted anything else so far in this painting we are just roughing it in roughing and, it in. and don't get caught up don't get in a teeny tiny brush and then spend five hours on it like you know really process it and think about it teeny tiny brushes <laughs> make for a lot of work they are a lot of work Very interesting to play with those colors. Very interesting. Very. Well, it's interesting to me. Might, it might be just frustrating for you. I like, like watching. This is the worst. What else am I going to do except watch it paint? You have nothing else to do today. <laughs> You're stuck. It's a good thing to be stuck doing. All right. Now I am going to lift up my... because it looks like I'm going to need to paint back some stuff to get it. Sometimes I have to lift my um, canvas to get a better view. And that's okay. I can put my white back on the top of the candles. I just have to think about how I have my ellipses. And that's something that you've got to think about every once in a while. How do I have my ellipses? Are my ellipses where I want them? Are they? I don't know. I'm just balancing out a little bit. Sometimes I come in and I'll be like, oh, I just want a little bit of distant zhuzh. A little distant zhuzh. Mm -hmm. Zhuzh, zhuzh. I 
I am going to, and I hate to go to a smaller brush, but I'm going to go to a smaller brush. This is a half inch angle. I just need a little more control. More control? Mm -hmm. I can see that. Getting a little white into there. And I think I'm going to need to put out some fresh white on my palette because it is just uh, not flowing off the brush particularly well right now. And that is because the white is. That's you know. important thing because if you're if it, if you need more paint, you got to put it out, right? You got to put it out. As I'm not putting it out. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm just kind of. Roughing in the lights on the tops of the candles and thinking about how I want it to be. Mm, more white, for sure. My white is fighting me. It started to dry, and when the white starts to dry, then it's just not going to be Then you need more pleasant, white. and I'm not enjoying it, and... You know. I do. There we go. Get into my blue here a little bit. Gonna have to put that white flame back. Mm. I just did to you what I said don't do. The flames? The flame. I just painted a thing you gotta paint out. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm gonna take this periwinkle down here as well. I'm going to brush across. Pretty loose stroke. Not quite a dry brush, but you can kind of see the directionality, can't you? A little bit, yeah. There we go. Starting to get there. So now I'm kind of just getting a little blue into my purple just to kind of periwinkle it up. Come here. That's looking kind of nice. Mm -hmm. Rinse out. It's a good time to change water. Um, it'd be very easy for your water to be graying your paint at this stage. And uh, you don't really want that. Mm. I'm trying to get a light value here. Sometimes you got to take it away from where you're mixing to get a good spot. I'm going to wipe this out. And I wipe my brush off just to control the amount of water that's on it. Yeah. Pull down a little highlight into the candle a bit. And go across. It's a very rough candle. Making a very, very rough candle. And then I'm going to pull in. As I come around, I'm going to change the direction on my stroke. I'm going to paint the well, so to speak. On the back side, maybe a little more blue and purple. Distinctly purple, though. We don't want to lose the purple of it. Mm.
Owner. A little bit darker back here. Mm. We're just shading the candle. All right, I rinse out pretty often just to give myself a little control over what's going on. And I'm gonna go uh, purple and blue. A little more purple up here. We're just playing with it, right? Yeah. Kind of creating a rough texture. Brush down and across. Create a rough texture. Brushing down and across. Not looking for blue candles. We still need them to be purple. Yeah. A little blue and white here. See how we just keep playing with it, right? Yeah. Across here, up at the top. Make a little rough area around the candle. Now I'm going to take a little of my purple. my cad red again but mostly my cad red right so it's purple tinting the cad red mm -hmm. there we go Little of that kind of warm purple red right there, the top. And then I'm going to lift my canvas so I can see it pretty well. And then we're going to come and put a little bit of it kind of coming down. A little bit to that lip there. A little bit to this little ring here. Notice I'm just kind of doing a little curve stroke at the top. So we're starting to paint in these beautiful pillars. I'm going to take a little of my white way to the side. Uh -huh. Get it in the mix there. I want a very light color. Right 
very light color at the edges of the candle. But whatever candle you paint is going to have a little light reflected through the wax. You've got to mm. be able to get that light reflected through the wax. I'm going to come across that brush stroke to kind of soften it out. When we get the oranges in here, it will all be suddenly very aglow. The purple and the orange play together well because this is a color palette of a sunset. Ah. So we're going to like this, right? We're going to enjoy this. This is going to be fun to us. A little blue at the front. Blue and purple together. Very dry brush, right? Same with here. This candle is much darker mm. than the others. And it does what, blend into the, the background quite well. But don't feel like you can't make it. I'm getting some just purple and see, I'm going to bring that in All right. and kind of hide that back of the candle with those shadows in the shadows, in the shadows. Good, good, good. I think I'll go ahead and put back my uh, flame now. Goodness gracious, we lost that, didn't we? I like to leave kind of like a little curved opening there. Do you see that? Sort of like a little C. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get a little more of the purple red again. Make sure that this candle is well lit as well. Adding those blues in, blending that in. I want that nice light lip. Mm -hmm. That's important. Bring a little reflection down. Another one up here. A bit of one here. Almost one here, so we'll just go ahead and put it in. We're also just starting to paint in the reflections of those candles. Yeah. All right. I think we'll dry this because we're about to change colors a yeah. little bit and add the glow to the candles. 
So while we're doing that, we'll give this a step and we'll come back and we'll put the flames on fire and we'll add the glow on the objects around. Well, you, you dry it first. Okay. I'll dry it and then we'll do a step. While you talk. So I'll let it, put, let it do a little dry there and I will come over here and say thank you guys for doing this. I'll make sure I get the... Uh, I'll try to keep the reference photo kind of out of the way. I know that it kind of got a little bit behind some stuff there. But I'll do, a, do, a, do my best to keep that adjusted. I'll move that over a little bit for you. Don't forget, check in the link in the description down below for all the stuff that we keep around. Uh, all of the things that we're doing. The calendar is located out on our website, theartsherpa.com. And now I will put up a step and mm -hmm. let Cinnamon talk to you for a moment. Some more talking to you. Woo! So the rest of this... Oh, I think I need a new one. Oh, oh that's right. You were asking for the steps. long class uh all right um for those of you who use a regular stay wet palette instead of the big one what do you do when you run out of mixing space on the paper um so with the stay wet palette if you're running out of mixing space and you're low on paint you can rinse the sheet out and start fresh um but it's you know you always want to kind of look for little berries. I always try to leave myself little places to go, even though like sometimes it seems like we can't see the, the <laughs> reference photo for the color mixing, but it, you want to leave yourself little places to go if you can. All right. So I'm going to get my number four round. Number four round for sure. And I'm going to come in and find my thing. So let's start to glow. Well, our yellow and red are great for glow. They'll make a nice orange. I'm gonna dry brush nice little orange out this way. Do the same here. I'll dry brush a nice little orange. A little orange glow. I might go ahead and just radiate that out. Interestingly enough, this candle has it much more on the right side than the left side. I'm going to get a little bit of white. Let's remind ourselves that there's an orange glow here, one here, and there's one here. We're going to put something in the center of that glow on those candles. Absolutely. I'm going to take a little bit of my yellow. And some white. Kind of work the outside edge of my flame here. Just a little bit. Maybe tap up a little bit of flame there. Oh, goodness, that is looking good. So we've got some glow going. Where else can we put glow? We can put glow a lot of little places. Um, I'm going to get a little bit on my brush here. And I'm going to drop brush, like, very gently on the corner with my angle brush around that. And let's kind of even go over that, let the white on our knee sort of show through. I'm here. Maybe a little more yellow here. A little more yellow in the center of that. We're exaggerating that. We're playing with that. Where else can we have that? Get a little bit of our orange over here. Make sure that some of our candle has a little orange glow. And I'm on the ellipse. I'm 
little bit there on the side. You can see how it's just starting to be a glowing candle, right? It's like kind of amazing. A little bit of white. I'm gonna come around here and kind of give myself a little lips of a glow as well. Dry brush it just a smidge to the edge. Just using a half inch angle, not too stressed on it. Same thing. Just let the dry brush dry brush. I'm gonna come to the edge of the candles here. I'll make sure. Oh, thank you. Mm, yeah, that's perfect. You're amazing. Mm, mm, mm. I'll be back later, guys. I'm going to add almost a pink here to come along this lip. That was, I added some cad red to my yellow and white. Isn't that nice? Mm. It's so nice. A little bit there. It's just fun to do. Look at how beautiful these candles have become. They are spectacular. Hmm. Let me get into my white. With my round brush. Paint the inside of that flame. There we go. Nice and white. You can always come in with just a little bit of blue. This is a weird thing you can do. You don't have to. It's just a, something you see on flame sometimes, so I like to put a little blue hmm. at that base. Now, the black wick. This one goes the opposite direction. I'm always dropping it on my canvas these days. <laughs> well, there you go. We've dropped a little black wick in. You want to know yeah. the secret of the black wick? What's the? Is it? Is it John Wick? <laughs> Don't kill his dog. Don't touch the dog. Don't. Okay, look. We all know the internet knows you don't murder pets. <laughs> the whole internet knows it. That is John Wick. Don't know it. I mean, he knew it. A lot of those people who like attacked him might not know it was the dog was the cutting off point. So you add a little bit of red glow to the end of the wick and it just, even though, no, we're not trying to do detail. We're not trying to do any of that with this particular piece. That little bit right there, it makes all the difference. And then also I'm going to come in and add a hot spot in that reflection. This one, I'm going to tap up. I'm going to dot that one. It's not a solid one. And then that dot's coming down. What? I know. It's just, what candles? Oh, my gosh. Do you love them? Do you just love them? I do. <laughs> Let's continue painting this very full still life. It's a very full still life. We, there are a lot of things in here. A lot of things to paint. A lot going on. So many. It is just stunning, though. Correct? Mm-hmm. Okay, so this is a step, and we'll come back and continue painting objects on the still life. I think the next thing we get to do is our pumpkin. Our green and white and brown pumpkin. The hardest of the pumpkins to paint. Why? 
oh, because it's a crazy color, and so we can't rely on uh, the color to make it work for us when it isn't working. Uh, what's the difference between glazing liquid and, and medium, uh, says Terry D. Okay, totally different products. So they have similar names. This glazing, gloss glazing liquid, and I don't, is a slow drying extender for acrylic colors. The glazing medium is a uh, medium that you add thin transparent layers of paint. You must, it quickly dries and you have to allow all the layers to be dry underneath. It does extend your paint, but it does not slow down the drying time of your paint in any way. Um, sometimes things have similar names. Um, sometimes they'll rename products because there is brand confusion. Like, I, I think I have that particular product in, like, three iterations at this point. Um, and so it is important to know that just because it says glazing liquid, it might just actually be glazing liquid or glazing medium, which is about transparent, uh, see-through coats of paint. But this does that and slows it down. So that's a... All right. Oh, and what's my mom's name for the YouTube channel? Ginger Cook Live. Ginger Cook Live. That was a question uh, that um, family family asked. All right, so this pumpkin needs to be painted before this spiky weird chestnut thingy. Pumpkin priority. Pumpkin priority is this pumpkin go first. Back to the big, back to the big, big, big. For chunkin' pumpkins. For my chunkin' pumpkins. I'm going to take a little of my black and brown together and I'm going to mix them together and I'm going to get my white. There we go. We're going to start from here. So this one has pattern and it has value and it is the you know, just painting in wise, probably just the more difficult of all the things on here um, because you really have to capture it. But what we're going to do is we're just going to go for it. We know we've got a chestnut in front of it. We don't mind. We're going to just let it be. Mm, let it be. Mm hmm I can always add black if I want to deepen the color and white if I want to lighten it initially. It's pretty good. Hmm. We've got stem again, don't we? More stem. Just keeps. Again, so we'll take our brown and green. And I will add some more brown. And we'll begin our stem process all over again. You just want to observe your stem. Each stem is a little different from the other stems. It's got a little personality. Every stem has personality. Gravity works. Gravity always works. Well, that's not always true. But oh, you know. gosh, you're going to physics argue me today? Just saying. It does. It's a relative thing. <laughs> Oh, you! I'm going to add a little yellow to this. Just He just can't help himself. And I'm going to put a little bit of a highlight on the left side. Just a bit. I'm interestingly enough going to get a little brown here. And kind of bring it on in. A little hint of brown on the inside of the corner. Hmm. <sighs> A little white. I'm on the corner of my brush. And it just takes very little to get my pumpkin in. Mm -hmm. It's a fun color. And well, I've got it. <laughs> I'm going to start adding some of that green. Couple places to the pumpkin. Look at that. We're just playing now. Oh. I got playful there. Sorry. Couldn't help you myself. did. You played. Sometimes I get playful. I 
add a little more yellow to it as I add more white. going to use my reference to understand where I want to put my colors and my highlights and my shadows. And we're roughing in, right? It does not need to be the most perfect at this moment. We're just capturing shape. Mm -hmm. Where I want to cool it, it's, it's going far away, right? A little purple, a little blue. Makes it right into my green, right? So these on the back side, look at that. Have a little bit of that lavender to them, but it pushes it back, doesn't it? Keeps it from going too far forward. Bring in that lavender in. No, unexpected. But sometimes you've got to push back. Even though it's white, and it is white, you've got to push it back. And that really creates some drama there, doesn't it? Yeah, a dramatic it does. piece. A dramatic piece. I'm going to go ahead and get a little of this again, my purple and blue. And I'm going to do something crazy. I'm going to add a little brown to it. What? I know. But look, I'm going to get some gray out of it. Almost like, again, like I've got some ultramarine on my palette. What a great... Oh, that works really well. Mm -hmm. I like it. And just pay attention to how light or dark something is. So like if it's kind of dark coming up through here and then there's Highlights, that's what we want to play against. Mm -hmm. And then over here, it's brown almost. So I'll add some brown because that is that shadow has like that brown orange reflection in it. And I don't need it to go away. That's the other thing I'm looking at is does the reflection have a little brown? Is it a little blue? What is it? And we're trying to say that this is in shadow. This lighter pumpkin, this ghosty pumpkin, mm -hmm. which is our brown and green and yellow and a lot of white. But sometimes it's this color. I'm going to go ahead and get some. A little brown and green going in there. Yeah. Burn sienna, phthalo green. On the corner of my brush. I make a little spotting because the pumpkin has a little spotting, doesn't it? Add a little brown there. 
Little brown, little spotty, mm. little color. A little black brown, maybe. I may switch down to my half inch angle just to give myself a little control mm -hmm. to start doing a little piecing on this, little, little dramas on this. More yellow. Just adding a little more white and color to that. To come in and piece out and <laughs> charm in the shape of our pumpkin or squash. I guess it's more of a squash that's pumpkin shaped, correct? It's a squish. It's a squish squash. There you go. Get my reference photo back up there. Sorry about that, guys. I'm going to come here and let my very light color work into this gray. But it's still pretty light. Very dry brushy over the top of it, right? Very dry brushy. Very dry brushy. Mm. Let it be rough over the surface of your canvas. A little patterning out. We got to get a little patterning out, but we also have to capture all the little values. Mm hmm. We want to get that going. Very light up here, right there. Very light. Another area that's right light right there. Big highlight right there. Highlight right there. Mm -hmm. A little bit up there at the top. And right there. Little brown and green. Some places I just touch light, like lighter, and I just like let just a little of it get on there. And mm -hmm. other times I might be like, you know, stronger with it. Brown and green. And again, don't put your whole heart into an area that we're going to paint over in two seconds. Right. That's going to be super disappointing if you do that. Kind of blending a little brown into that.
There we go. Those last little highlights on the pumpkin. There's our really lovely, wonderful white pumpkin. And we are ready to move on to Crazy Chestnut. Yeah? Yeah. You think you're ready to move on to the Crazy Chestnut? Getting on to Crazy Chestnut. Crazy Chestnut. We are painting a huge still life in a very short amount of time, guys. Right? This is usually people take a week. We are doing something amazing in a sitting. We are being brave and assertive in our colors. We are being strong and making quick decisions about our placement. And because of that, we're going to have a very loose, expressive, wonderful painting. All right. Now, while I'm here, I'm going to take a little bit of my black. And I may need to put out some more black. Mm-hmm. I'm for sure going to need to put out some more brown. And we're going to need to do a lot in a short amount of time, right? So, Because we still have water chestnut, some twigs to add, a few pine cones, and of course, very involved bunch of corn. <laughs> Take a little of my black and blue together. And begin the process of painting little twigs. And I'm going to come around here. I had little highlights. Mm. This doesn't take a lot. These are just kind of down in the shadows. They're a wonderful texture. They have a lot going on. Right? You don't want to not include them. The framing of the candles was terrific. Over here, maybe the shadows are a little darker towards the right-hand side, and then lighter as they come over towards the left-hand oh. side. Twigs have sharp angles. They have little breaks. So when you're painting the highlights, you're going to want to capture that, right? Coming around that side there. Does there need to be a lot in it? I can always get a little bit of my orange and brown. Say that perhaps. There's a little glow on the twigs. You don't put too much, otherwise it becomes the whole thing. And you don't want it to be the whole thing. You just want it to be some of the thing. Nice little bit of kit around the candles. Right, not too bad. I'm gonna take uh so in the front here, I'm gonna grab a little of my yellow and red. I might mix some black into it. And some brown. I know I'm going to have shadows. I'm just painting the spaces now. Mm -hmm. Very loose, very open because we're going to have to um, 
create a base there for everything. Now, coming around the side, right, it's going to be quite dark. And then it's dark under objects, so be sure that you have shadows. Number one thing you've got to have in your work is where there should be shadows, make sure there's shadows. Grab whatever I've got here and I'm gonna rough up this area up front. I'm doing random strokes back and forth. I'm not trying to be precious. I'm just trying to mm -hmm. create some dimensionality. I'll grab different colors off my canvas. I'm about it. Grab a little bit of that blue. Remember I said there would be blue? Mm -hmm. Bring it forward. Makes a boring background. Not so boring. Mm -hmm. Not so boring. This looks nice coming up. It's a nice cord. Again, it can't be all my, everything to me because if it's everything to me, I'm in trouble. <laughs> if it's everything to me, I'm in trouble. I'm going to paint a black center here. And then I'm going to grab some brown. And apply kind of a round shape blending back like you do. I'm going to go ahead and get into some orange. Very powerful stuff, the orange. Start to imply what will be the highlight in a little bit. Chestnuts in here, you know. Mm -hmm. Let's get a little more orange into that yellow. A little more red, right? Come here. And it's going to need a lot more white. A couple places there. Mm -hmm. There we go. That's good. And, oh, I love this color, so I'm going to just load it up right here and add that reflection to the chestnut a little bit. And then I'll come back with something hot in a second, but that is just too good. So I've got my twigs kind of a going, and I've got my, I put my cool brush that I was going to do everything with. Oh, my gosh, where did I put my cool? Oh, there it is. <laughs> So this is an Art Minds DIY home brush from the craft section of Michael's. It was cheap. It came in a pack. Um, I would use it. At, so like I might normally grab a hog brush out and be like, try hog or try fan or try a different brush. But guess what? I can probably do everything with this. And I'm going to begin by getting it a little bit damp. Not a lot damp because it's hog. And they hold too much water. And I'm going to come here and start with pinching it. That's going to control the amount of size my brush has. And I'm going to bring some little wild marks coming off on the top side and on the bottom side. That was fun. Hmm. I'm going to get a little brown into everything. Maybe come up into this little orange area that I have.
Look at that. Making water chestnut. Isn't that what this is? Chestnut? Mm hmm. Feels like that's what it is. I'm going to get into a lot more yellow. And I'm going to grab some white right here. I have to kind of splay it for that to kind of get it to chestnut not out. I can do that. It's not an expensive brush, mm. is it? No, it doesn't have to be the most expensive brush. You just have to understand what you're trying to do. What I'm trying to do is paint a bunch of little spiky hairs. Without painting one hair at a time. That's what I'm trying to do. What are you trying to do? I enjoy watching you, I think. That's what you're trying to do? Mm-hmm. All right, I'm going to get real light. And we're going to add a little highlight to that. A little highlight there. That's a lot more. <laughs> we just painted the weirdest thing, didn't we? It's really good looking good. It looks good, right? It is what it is, and we know what it is, and... can always come in with some light colors and kind of define a few spiky bits, can't you? Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can. You're not stuck with anything, but you don't have, always have to have this crazy, amazing tool that just, you know, was a lot of money that, you know, caused you a lot of trouble in your life. You don't have to have that. All right, let's call that the water chestnut. We'll come back and, um... Maybe we'll do some pine cones. You guys ready to do some pine cones? Oh, no, I need them. I hate to say it. You know, it's because I paint and then I don't drink my coffee while it's warm. And then I paint and I don't drink my coffee while it's warm. And I paint and I don't drink my coffee while it's warm. Uh, all right. So... When you're painting something and you're looking for tools and you're looking for things to add to your art box or your art skill set, um, things don't necessarily have to be the most expensive thing in the world to be wonderful. You just have to understand what things will give you what effect. What types of bristles will give you a fluffy kind of water chestnut? I've never painted a water chestnut before. Right? <laughs> That's a new thing for me. Um, but I have enough experience with enough types of brushes to have a pretty good idea that certain brushes will give me a result. I also know enough about hog bristle brushes to know, um, to wash them thoroughly and try to get all the loose hog hairs out because the cheaper the brush is, the more likely it is to shed. If you have a very expensive brush and it's shedding, um, that's bad and they should give you your money back. But, <laughs> but a little shedding is okay. Like, up to 10, 20 hairs, but like 50 hairs, that's not okay. Like in, in some cheap brushes, I mean, you'll up offload almost half the brush into the sink. That's fine. You only needed what was left. You know, what was left on this thing was plenty. Actually, this one actually didn't, this was only 10 hairs. I, it, it did a lot of things that an expensive brush would do. <laughs> so go figure. You know, I will always tell you what I'm using. Yes, we make brushes. It's the Art Sherpa brushes. You can get those in Michael's online, and you can get them with the brush guys, and they're red-handled, and they're amazing. But you can buy a different brush and get a great result, too. So just always know that. Mm, John, how are you doing? It's been a long day, but we're cooking through. Yeah, a we're doing pretty good. big project. This is a big, big still life, guys. This is not like a, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do today. Still, It's a big still mm. life. Okay. 
So I've got corn here and I've got pine cones. I think I'm going to start thinking about pine cones. Pine cones are, they're an interesting little beast because they're a particular type of shape. I think I want to use a filbert, a small filbert to do them. All right, because I think I'll be able to get the little lips of my um, brush. So this is a Textor Raphael. These are both Textor Raphael. No, this is a Precision. This is a Textor. These were both really good acrylic brushes. Maybe I'll use the Precision. It's a little softer, right? It's a little softer. And I'm going to come here and load up. And I'm actually going to weirdly load up with just black and brown, very dark at first. Okay, right here, see, in this still life in my arrangement, the water chestnut has taken up a lot. So really, I can put pine cones over here, which I will, and I can put a pine cone over here, which I will. I'm going to kind of get a generalized shape of my pine cone and the scale of my pine cone. Pretty small in relationship to the objects around it. They are egg-shaped with rough edges. So I definitely want to make sure that I've got that represented. I feel like it's best to, um, I'm going to do this. Diff they do have directionality. So like roses, they have an opening and unfurling. And so if you're doing um, an arrangement of them, it's really a good idea to have them facing the direction when you're laying down your brush strokes, which is why I've turned my canvas, right? Because I've got a little grouping of them here. I may at the end put one over here for balance, but we'll see where we're at, right? We will see where we're at. Because it could be a little in front of this. Oh, we'll see. I'm going to begin by getting a little more brown loaded onto my brush. And I'm going to just sort of pull down in a layer. And then when we come down the edge, I go more on the edge there. You know how we're doing? Mm-hmm. just a little bit and you just have to have the uh, egg shape for it to work and I'll have to come through and do this in a couple values that's the only thing that you've got to be thinking of is that And they definitely tile the way you might expect. Mm -hmm. They are a tiling little creature. I'm going to come here and get a little yellow on my brush and a little orange. And it's definitely lighter. Let's see, we just give a little kiss of, of some energy to that. Highlight the edges. Sliver in for the bottom ones, right? If they're more open. You can't really have a wrong pine cone. Your pine cone is valid. <laughs> All pine cones are valid. All pine cones are valid. But they are, seriously. And as you can see, we very quickly get a little pine cone in. I know. It's kind of shocking how great those go in and how quickly. I want to see how the corn looks here with this uh, little space there. I'm going to kind of come under here and, again, kind of create a little shading Yeah. under the... Water chestnut, and we'll glaze up my pumpkin a bit to see how I push that all back. Mm -hmm. Right, that's important. And I may blend some of that value up so that my water chestnut is also in similar lighting conditions. Similar lighting conditions. Now, if I want to be fancy, 
and come in and make it orange and I can tip some of the pine cone that might have a little candlelight on it. You wouldn't necessarily hit all of it, but sometimes giving a little glow is that extra pizzazz that yeah. something needs to just be like, see that? Now the pine cones are a glow. Just amazing. It's just the best. All right, so let's come back and corn. We're nearly done. Yeah? Yeah. Are you shocked with yourself? This still, still life is getting there, but it is. It's getting there. It is super de duper getting there. All right, here we go. So, you know, this is the stage you want to sit back from your still life and evaluate. You want to evaluate it, you know, the hue of everything. Are things light and dark enough? Are, are the focused light areas holding your attraction? The focus of a painting is the greatest area of contrast and also the greatest area of contrast in color. So really the big focus of the painting is here in the candles. Just by their, by their nature, it's gonna hold your eye the most. What keeps you balanced is the surprise of the colors over here and the way they play against each other and the weird texture that's happened um, keeps you kind of involved and engaged in the piece. I wanna balance some things out, so I'm gonna come here and Oh, sorry. I'm going to kind of tip that back a bit with a little blue. And I may knock some of my blue back. See how I'm kind of knocking some of the blue back with a little bit of brown glaze. It's still there, but I'm just pushing it into the background because it was coming too far forward. I wanted it there, but not that far forward. Want a little bit of it there, but not that far forward. The corn. Hmm. Mm -hmm -hmm. The corn is interesting because it's so many colors on this cob and it's it's going to be a lot like a scaling. I'm trying to decide if I want to do a round or a filbert to do this because definitely the shape of the brush could aid me. It won't make it happen or not happen, but much like at the pine cones, it could be helpful. So I'm going to begin by experimenting with a little of my black and blue together. And I'm going to start to make little strokes that speak about maybe the black corn, niblets in the corn. You know, maybe some of them are, are a little more grayed out, which is interesting. Let's see, I don't, you know, so just they're very hard to see at this stage. I'm putting in the black first because I'm going to get a lot of big impact from my yellow. And so getting the dark ones in first is really going to help me. Got some storming happening outside. We do have some storming happening outside. I'm going to add a little bit of the yellow and black to what I've got going on. And I'm still using my filbert to help me sort of imply maybe some texture. And come forward and be like, hmm. Also here has a bit of a cob thing happening, so I could paint in the cob a little, couldn't I? A little highlight to the cob. A little highlight to the cob there as well. I think now looking at this, I want this corn cob to come for forward further. I'm actually going to kind of change this. And the reason for that is I feel like these three items are too in line with each other. And you might make a decision about that where you're like, oh, I, I feel like that's going too far forward or. Hmm. Or it's not far forward enough. And for me, what this is, is that this needed to be in front of this and then create that uneven space. Otherwise, it was just too lined up, too lined up. Right. Yeah. 
getting that going a bit. I'm going to take my yellow. It's okay if it has a little brown in it or a little red in it. That's, it should be yellow, but it should only be yellow in relationship to what's around it. Painting colorful corn. So this is an interesting, you know, plant. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't really use these as much, I think, in cooking anymore like we used to. I'm going to go ahead and, interestingly enough, add some purple into this mix, believe it or not. Yeah. A little white into it. Mm. To purple. I want a hint of purple, but not like purple. There we go. Right. Getting a little bit of that going there. So starting to see that corn happen. I'm going to rinse out. I'm going to get a little more yellow on my brush. This time it'll be a little bit brighter, but not completely pure yellow. Hmm. Because if I went completely pure cad yellow, it would look like a... It would look too much like a street sign had hit my corn. Hmm. Not in some places. And see, even this toned down is so bright. Isn't it super bright? Yeah. It is. It's super bright. It's got a lot of contrast there. Let's see here. While I'm here, I might as well add some of these colors to my other corn that's over here. Because there's certainly some of these colors around. I think it's always a good idea to kind of blend some of that through. Mm hmm It can come through and always kind of be like. Capturing some of that feeling of the corn. Feeling of the corn. <laughs> Very different than children of the corn. <laughs> Get some purple in there and some red. I know, shocking. Powerful stuff, especially when I come down here and blend this into maybe some of what's happening over here. So with this, I'm going to come in and get maybe a little more black on here. I definitely want to capture some of the feeling of what I'm seeing, mm -hmm. right? The textures and stuff. I'm not trying to paint individual kernels. I'm trying right. to get that sense of this colorful corn over at the side here. Colorful corn. The side is maybe more in shadow, so I'm blending that up through there. Corn is showing that it's coming out of the background. Now it does have some nice orange and red in it, and I don't want to not have any of that in there, so I'm going to mix up. It's not pure. I'm 
That's definitely in there. Oh, right. Greater corn. Look at this go. Mm. It's rather pretty here, isn't it? Yeah. So pretty. A little bit of a highlight here. You know, maybe we're going to get back into that green and yellow kind of cool highlight we had going. Really like that with the white. It was on the stems of everything. Really made me happy. I like that as a color. So I'm holding it to the side just so I can see things. Mm -hmm. Get a little yellow and black going in there. I don't mind. Mm -hmm. There's some interesting kind of dark corn in here. Even in a couple places on the colorful red and yellow corn. Yep. We don't want to miss doing that. Those isn't that great? It really is. How those come in now. For this, I'm going to get into again my reflection color, which is my purple and blue together. And I'm going to put out a little more white because I want some fresh white to work. Because now we're going to go through and hit the pops of color. Okay, guys, we're going to hit some pops of color. That's it. We're going to make a step, or we're going to just go for it. Um, let's make it a step and then we'll come back and we'll hit the pops of color and then we're done. Can you believe? And we're going to do that right before the storm kills. <laughs> we're killing. We're racing before the storm kills the stream, right? <laughs> How are you guys doing with this? Are you, are you getting this? Is like, oh, like this is a way to do a still life and I can do it in a sitting. And I don't have to be so intense within it, and I can still capture something that really speaks to everything that's going on. Uh, Emily Floor says, how do you make sure to make time to paint? I work full time, and by the time I finish the day, prepare for dinner and eat and do housework, there's so little time left in the day. So don't, like, put yourself in a position to be forced to paint and feel like you've got to do it because that'll just take the joy out of it. Um, I would say for if I were in your situation, what I would do is I would have a corner in my house that was set up to paint any time. Everything was ready. So if I had 15 minutes or a half hour, I wasn't having to have anything between me and my creative time. In fact, any of you that are really like limited on time, you don't want to have to go pull your art supplies out and set everything. You're going to be out of time and out of energy. What you mm -hmm. want is an image pick, some, a project ready to go, Everything out ready, water cups full, everything ready so you can sit down and take the time when you have it. All right. Da -da 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 -da. Hopefully that was kind of a cool and happy tip. Yeah. All right. So for the corn, again, I want that, I want that kind of uh, neutralized reflection. It's light, but it's not pure white, you know. Just a few. Just a few. Just a few kernels of corn. 
for catching a highlight. Oops, that was a strong one. Push that back a bit. I'm not going to highlight every kernel of corn either, just some of them. Mm. See how that helps the corn be corn? Oh, thank you again to everybody with all the stars and the support from Super Chat. Super, super helpful. I'm going to grab my half inch and I'm going to mix another lighter reflection. It's not pure white, but it is lighter. And I'm going to make sure that there's a bit of a hot spot right there on the back pumpkin. Just a little, maybe. And a little bit on the front pumpkin. A little bit on the chestnut. And for sure you want something strong on this. There and here. These are hot spots. You're like, what? Hmm. And a few of them on your corn, but not like a lot. Do you know what I mean? You want your corn, not a lot. So that little highlights really make a big difference. They do. We pull it all together. They're not strong enough on those different reflections. Make sure the center of your flame is light enough. I'm just making sure it's light enough. These spots on your uh, on your pine cones. Mm -hmm. Not a lot, just enough to say, oh well. Some highlights caught it and were were there. And if you get too much, you just come back and you just like, oh, like a little less. Yeah, I took it to yellow to make it just a little less. You can do that if you feel like, oh, I got too much going. Just balance out where you think the light will have hit. A little bit on the chestnut. Yeah, I'm happy with it, guys. I'm going right. to give that a signature. I hope you had t fun today. I hope that you found still lives maybe a little more inviting and accessible and doable. Um, I think it's really important that you make a little time for yourself when you can, even when you're busy. So do the things you can to get the obstacles to your creative time out of your way. Mm -hmm. That way, if you've got 10 minutes here or... Five, even five for yourself you can sit down and do something um i really appreciate getting to share this with you guys today i do i'm gonna give my signature it's gonna be a twig today my signature is a twig now <laughs> That's so great.
Thank you for still lifing with me. Uh, we've got the incredible forest this weekend. Be good to yourselves. Be good to each other. And I want to see you really soon. Bye-bye.